about 25 people connected so far, so I think we should just go ahead and get it started. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Waterwatch's first summer uh, webinar series. Uh, really excited to be here tonight. Um, my name is Neil Brandt. I'm our development director here at Waterwatch of Oregon, and I'm joined by John DeVoe, our executive director, and the author John Larison. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, through this, we'll ask folks to hold questions and, and answers until the end of the call. Um, there's a Q&A box along the bottom, so feel free to uh, ask them at any point, and then we'll get to them at the end. And uh, if anybody's having any technical issues or, or has any questions or concerns, please feel free to shoot me an email. It's just neil, N-E-I-L, at waterwatch.org. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to our executive director, John DeVoe, to uh, welcome us in. Hey, thanks, Neil. Um, my name's John DeVoe, and I'm the executive director of Waterwatch. Um, for those of you who may not be intimately familiar with Water Watch. Our mission is to protect and restore stream flows and uh, for fish, wildlife, and people who depend on healthy rivers. We also remove obsolete dams. We have a long history of doing that. And we secure the balanced water policies that Oregon needs in a climate change world. Um, some of our major in achievements include the In-Stream Water Rights Act. There are now about 1,700 in-stream water rights around Oregon to protect stream flows on a variety of streams. Uh, we were heavily involved in the Free the Rogue campaign that resulted in the removal of three main stem Rogue River dams and several tributary dams and recreated one of the longest free-flowing reaches of, water, of river in the West, 157 miles on the Rogue River. We've also achieved many legislative and agency policies that result in improved management of Oregon's waters and help the state adapt to a changing climate. <clears throat> Every river, stream, and aquifer in the state benefits from, from our work, and we really have been a west-wide leading organization in this space. If you'd like to know more about our work or, or for Oregon's water future, you can feel free to contact any of the staff. You can contact me at WaterWatch uh, or check out our website. So that's a little bit about WaterWatch. Um, it's my privilege tonight to introduce John Larison. John is the author of several books. Um, he was born in, he's a native Oregonian. Uh, he was born in Oregon in 1979, the year I got out of high school, so he's a lot younger than I am. Uh, he worked as a fly fishing guide and as a high school English teacher before turning full-time to writing. Uh, he's written several books. In 2008, he published a book uh, called The Complete Steelheader. In 2009, his first novel was published. Uh, it's called Northwest of Normal. In 2011, uh, another novel came out called Holding Lies, and in 2015, uh, Whiskey When We're Dry was published. Um, that's his most recent novel. It was a Los Angeles Times and Seattle Times bestseller, an indie next pick, and a finalist for the Ken Kesey Award and the Will Rogers Medallion. Uh, Whiskey When We're Dry was also named a best book by O Magazine, Goodreads, Entertainment Wee Weekly, Outside Magazine, PALS, NPR's All Things Considered, and The Times of the United Kingdom, among others. It's currently being developed for a feature film. John lives with his family near Bell Fountain, Oregon, which uh, even as a map diehard geek that I am, I was unfamiliar with Bell Fountain, so I looked it up on Google and I learned that it is also the home of the world headquarters of the International Goat Yoga Institute, an organization that I had not previously heard of, but that I am now curious about. Uh, but Bell Fountain is also not very far from the headwaters of the Siletz River, which is one of Oregon's great coastal rivers with wonderful runs of a variety of salmon and steelhead. And it's a river that flows right through the center of John's life and his family. John is at work now on another novel, and this book will partly address the role of climate change in human development and how humans address the changing climate in, in earlier forms of ourselves. Today's presentation is going to open a window into John's creative process, and I think it'll show one slice of the research for the book he's working on now. 
uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Larson and we're very lucky to have him tonight. And I, I thank him very much for being here. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, I've been uh, really looking forward to this uh, presentation. It's actually the first time that I get to talk about this research uh, that I've been doing for about four and a half years now on the, the history of climate change, um, the human, um, human reactions to climate change. And the book I'm working on is actually set in, in the future, but um, uh, to learn about what the future is, might look like for us, um, I felt like I needed to, to dig deep uh, into our past. Uh, and I learned some really incredible things, and that's what I'd like to uh, share with you today. Um, I'm going to try um, opening a presentation here for you. Uh, and, and really what um, this presentation is about is uh, the origins of creativity, the connection between uh, water and creativity, and really how um, without catastrophic climate change, we wouldn't be here now, um, which is a pretty compelling fact, I think. Um, so, you know, I'm guessing that you're like me, uh, and we're really the same in a lot of ways. Uh, we're both drawn to water. Uh, we like riding in it, riding on top of it, or maybe diving underneath it. I bet as a kid, your summer recesses were spent like mine, splashing in a creek, um, or perhaps twisting in the spray of a hijacked fire hydrant. And we remember those afternoons as some of the happiest, uh, the most enthused, the most inspired of our childhood. Water inspires people, plain and simple. It always has. And tonight I'll tell you the story of why we're so compelled by H2O. But first, a disclaimer. Um, I'm not an archaeologist or a biologist, um, just an artist. Uh, and we'll pretend that makes me qualified to give you a tour of some scientific terrain that is obviously uh, far above my pay grade. Uh, this story is about our shared human history. Um, it's also about human resiliency. Uh, and the facts and theories you'll hear tonight um, have been distilled from the research I've been doing uh, for this novel that will be called The Ancients. Uh, here's the truth. Without a cataclysmic drought that struck Africa 200,000 years ago, you and I wouldn't be here now, and either would the thousands of years of art humans have left behind. Without this ancient climate crisis and the adaptations it forced upon our ancestors, the artistic temperament might never have become a trait of the human animal. In that twisted alternative reality where human beings don't have the capacity to interpret, create, or share art, this planet still might be walked by herds of mammoth, and grain would probably only grow and sparsely there in one geo region never named the Fertile Crescent. Art is more than simply inspiration acted upon. Art and the ability to shape meaning from the chaos around us is the essential human characteristic. Without it, we couldn't imagine technical innovation, political organization, or a better future for our children. Without art, we wouldn't have a name for justice. Water is more than simply, or water is, uh, is just plain beautiful. <laughs> uh, and beauty, I really, I think, is where um, any story about water should begin. Uh, but beyond the beauty and the obvious fact that we need to drink about 60 to 70 ounces of the stuff a day just to stay alive, Water has a long history of inspiring our art. I realized while preparing for tonight uh, that of the four novels I've written, all of them begin with descriptions of water, uh, which I had never noticed before. Um, maybe that's strange, but I really had never noticed that before. And um, it, it struck me as um, significant. And I realize you know, that I'm not the only artist who's finding uh, inspiration in water. I'd like to, to look at some, some art now, uh, inspired by water, uh, and really let you interpret this art for yourself, but I'm, I'm gonna offer you a, a little bit of um, uh, a window into how I'm, I'm seeing these works of art. 
Uh, so these are sculptures by the English artist Andy Goldsworthy. And you can notice how he's at play with water's physical properties here. Uh, first, its ability to ref reflect light, which is really magical. You know, even the clearest mountain water becomes paradoxically a mirror when it's looked at at the right angle. Uh, and that's just a compelling feature of water that's probably been inspiring artists for thousands of years. Um, in the middle work, you'll see that he's using uh, the solid state of water, ice, to suggest its liquid state. And in that third image there on the right, uh, you know, see whatever you will, my eye perceives a frozen crystal of water vapor. Now, this next work, uh, the background really does no justice to this next piece, but um, notice how more use on a PO used simple pencil strokes to capture the tumultuous movements of the sea. Um, this is really, you know, a really simple image, but it's also striking in how much movement it captures in its stillness. There's something tropical and lush about this piece by Rainy Noble of Germany. Um, but the good mood is infringed upon, I'd say, by that uh, chunk of what could be concrete um, or possibly a section of reef poisoned by sunscreen. Um, maybe I'm too cynical about that. Maybe it's not a, uh, maybe there's nothing being infringed upon there. Maybe that is just a piece of old coral, but uh, whatever you see. And shifting streams here for a moment. Uh, notice how Emily Dickinson transcends pun to draw our attention to the elemental quality of water, both physically and culturally. I think that the root of water, the, sorry, I think the root of wind is water. It would not sound so deep were it a firmamental product. Airs no ocean keep, Mediterranean intonations. To a current's ear, there's maritime conviction in the atmosphere. A lot there. And in this photograph by Jim Chuchu of Kenya, you'll find a continuation of that elemental theme, uh, but this time in the context of oppression, possibly, or maybe that's salvation we're seeing. But again, notice how the artist here is really exploring mystery. For sure, we can feel the spiritual side of water in this work by char child art artist Ayusha Bhagwat Raham. She entitled the piece Tirtha, which means in Hindi, washing away all sins. And I think she just nailed water, too. When you look at the water around this, this woman, it's, it's just gorgeous, um, really evocative. And water and the art it inspires can inspire us to act. Here's an excerpt from a poem uh, by the poet laureate of the United States, Joe Harjo, uh, who's the country's first indigenous poet laureate. I heard that they started drilling today. Water is life. I heard the sound of bit hit bone. Water is life. I heard the blood rush up from the earth's heart. Water is life. I heard the children asking for a drink. Water is life. It's not just contemporary artists who feel inspired by water. Take a look at these cave paintings from southern France. These are 32,000 years old, um, and the artist who left them chose the canvas with care. Uh, so this is a big cave, but the artist chose to paint these images on a wall that's near a spring in the cave where the artist could actually hear the trickle of water uh, as he or she worked. But precisely why is the human animal so inspired by water? 
JFK gave us a pretty good answer on a warm, windy day in 1962 while in Newport, Rhode Island. You can almost feel his desire to be out on his boat, not giving a speech. Uh, I really don't know why it is that all of us are so committed to the sea, except I think it is because we all came from the sea. And it is an interesting biological fact that all of us in our veins have the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore we are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or watch it, we are going back from whence we came. Now, JFK is right and wrong. I looked and the salinity of blood is about a quarter that of seawater. So he wasn't right there. Uh, maybe the salinity of the brackish water near the Yacht Club, Mr. President. Um, but Kennedy's right about us coming from water and wanting to return to it. A few years ago, while searching for a new book project and trying to overcome a sense of doom about climate change, I began learning more about the historical precedent of humans surviving a sudden and profound climate shift. You might be surprised to know that we've been doing this kind of surviving for millions of years, and we're actually pretty good at it. Uh, early in this quest, I stumbled upon images of that cave in southern France. And now I mentioned these are over 30,000 years old, and the, the paint the artists used to leave these images is a mixture of tallow and charcoal, uh, and sometimes tallow and ochre. Now, tallow is a form of rendered fat, in case you don't know. Uh, it's portable, shelf stable. Uh, it was a major commodity for people um, up until just a couple years ago. Um, it's a lot like Crisco. It has the consistency of Crisco. Um, and it was the Crisco before there was Crisco. Now, climbers found this cave. Uh, here's the view from the outside. And uh, no doubt this place Pont de Arc drew humans 30,000 years ago for the same reason it does today. Uh, I mean, look at that arc, archway there. And imagine seeing that thing when you had never heard of a bridge before. You know, you'd never seen a bridge, you didn't have a word for a bridge, maybe. Uh, also, notice what an amazing place this is. Those of you who know rivers know that it's, it's exceedingly rare for there to be a, a rock bridge over water. Uh, there was a you know, famous one in the Columbia um, until a few hundred years ago. Uh, but also, this is a place where anyone going upstream can't just follow the water. They have to climb up over this thing. Uh, so it's a really striking place. And now, and, and 30,000 years ago. Uh, but the, the climbers who found the cave were scaling the limestone wall on the far left of the image. Uh, and they felt air leaking from a crack. This is just amazing to me. Uh, and they managed to dig a hole into the, to the crack and they turned their headlamps on and saw this, right? I mean, that just blows the mind. Um, and I'm a little embarrassed, I, I gotta say, to admit how obsessed I became with these works of art. Um, in the early stages of working on this novel, these were the things I looked at first thing in the morning. They were the things I looked at, at during my lunch break. Uh, I'd look at them right before falling to sleep and I'd have weird dreams that were in charcoal and tallow. Um, and really, I think to understand these images, you got to imagine how they were meant to be viewed, which is by torchlight, people would dip, um, they had these tallow lanterns that they would light or they would take a um, stick and rub sap on it and or tallow on it and light it. And so these images were meant to be seen in flickering flame light. And when you see them in that flickering flame light, they are actually moving. You can see those horns at the top of the image. Um, it's an abstraction there of a, of a woolly rhinoceros's horn. Uh, and you can see it in those, in those multiple images there. I think five different images of it. Well, when the, when the light is flickering on that, it looks like that uh, woolly rhino is raising his horn up and down in an aggressive posture. Uh, and anyway, when I was looking at these images, really, I was trying to figure out, you know, who painted you and why. Uh, these images, this art became a window for me into the ancient mind.
And to really answer that question, who painted the, you and why, um, I had to dig deeper. Uh, in fact, I had to leave Europe altogether and venture to Africa 1.3 million years ago when a sudden drought there uh, sent wildfires through the extensive forest in Africa and left behind savanna. Uh, so where there had once been fruit trees and easy escape for apes, uh, now there was this open savanna, um, a lot less fruit to rely on and a, a not as easy a, a way to escape from predators. Um, and so as we came down out of these trees, as we started moving between clumps of trees, uh, our diets changed. We started spending more time scavenging the kills of animals uh, who were better suited to the predatory game than we were. Uh, since lions and hyenas got the best meat, uh, we became especially adept at eating what they left behind, which were bones. Uh, we learned to break bones open and eat the marrow from inside those bones. Uh, and pretty soon these new elemental or environmental demands, coupled with these rich new food opportunities, resulted in a doubling of our brain capacity. We stood straighter, we couldn't climb as well as we used to, but we could run faster. Uh, and here's an artist's impression of what we might have looked like then. Uh, these, these early humans, as you can see, looked a lot like us. Uh, they could speak, maybe not in sentences, but uh, they definitely had language. They lived in small settlements that were built near water and were um, seasonal. When the water dried up, uh, these early humans always moved following the best food opportunities. Our new life on the savanna required tools, uh, new tools to us, which we hadn't needed before, and we, we learned to make them. Uh, these are real coarse tools, uh, not, not all, I mean, they're, they're technically hard to make, but they're nothing compared to the rock tools that we're gonna see a bit later on in the presentation. Uh, these are a pair of blades that were likely used for fracturing bone or hacking open the coarse skin of some root pulled from the ground. Um, these aren't really sharp enough to do much cutting of meat. So um, one thing I've learned in this research is that a lot of the stuff we learned about early humans in the 50s and 60s and 70s was heavily gendered. Um, and so the men who were doing the research were always quick to find evidence of like violence and war and such. Um, in fact, your notions of like cavemen, those are all, those all grow from that, that gendered research that was done. Um, and really the truth is it's much more family focused. It's a lot less violent. Um, and to me, it's more compelling. Uh, but the, you know, the climate never changed. Uh, or never stopped changing. So during ice ages, the savanna would grow wetter and forest would actually overtake the African continent. So you can see in these two images here, we have uh, an image of Africa today and we have a depiction of what Africa looked like uh, during a narrow window um, of a glacial period, the last glacial period about 20 something thousand years ago. And these, uh, these periods of bounty where everything's green allowed Homo erectus uh, to follow the best food right off the continent of Africa. Um, so they probably didn't know they were doing it, but if you know, a teenage, teenager decides to leave home, that teenager is gonna go over the, the horizon, start a new life. Pretty soon after generations of teenagers, they've walked off Africa and they're, they're walking all over the world. Uh, Homo erectus went um, to the, extreme edges of Asia, went to the extreme edges of the glaciers in Europe, and those that left adapted to their new environments. These are the people who would become uh, seven distinct human populations that at one time archaeologists believed were separate species, uh, including Neanderthals and Denisovians. Um, you know about Neanderthals uh, in Europe, probably the Denisovians were um, uh, were in Asia, and interestingly, they were really well adapted to altitude. Uh, they could um, climb the highest peaks without oxygen. Uh, 
Um, and where do these people go? Uh, I'll get back to that. The answer might surprise some of you. Uh, but back in Africa, something terrible was about to happen. Sorry, this is an image of, of people leaving the continent. Um, yeah, so something terrible was about to happen. Uh, if you take a look at this graph of the ice ages, you're going to see that cyclical pattern uh, of natural shifts um, in the climate. Now, this was caused by uh, the shifting amounts of carbon in the atmosphere, primarily. Uh, and those amounts of carbon uh, affected mean global temperatures and altered long-standing weather patterns. And what you'll notice, um, maybe you can see my cursor here, is here we are in the moment. Uh, but if you look back to about 150,000 years ago, you're going to see this steep line coming up here uh, when global temperatures were quite a bit higher than they are now. Not as high as they may go uh, with human-caused climate change, but um, still quite high. And what happened in this moment is that those savannas that humans had been relying on vanished. They became harsh deserts. Uh, Interestingly, they weren't all that hot. They were a cool desert, um, maybe like uh, Eastern Oregon in a way, uh, but they were really inhospitable and Homo erectus had no way to survive there. Um, the skills that Homo erectus had uh, weren't sufficient to allow uh, you know, the communities to survive. So Homo, Homo erectus did what they knew to do, which was to follow water. And these families uh, would just keep following anything green, and eventually they ended up here on the African coastline uh, where a band of green lingered while rest of the continent went dry. Now, once there, life was totally different for early people, uh, and we took shelter in caves. Uh, so here's one from the African coastline that has held that held human settlements for over 130,000 years. Now, earlier I said 30,000 years ago, uh, that, you know, those, those paintings were made in the cave. Uh, 30,000 years ago seems like a real long time to us. Just imagine people living in the vicinity of this cave for 130,000 years continually. You, I, I can't wrap my mind around it, really. Um, but to keep themselves and their children fed, these early Homo erectus on the coast had to adapt again. And this time they began to adapt to a diet of seafood, especially shellfish and sea greens in those first years. Um, Homo erectus had been so productive on the savanna because we learned how to identify patterns in the landscape. Just as earlier ancestors had profited from reading and predicting the patterns of ripening fruit, Homo erectus over a million years had learned to predict when rains would come and where the animals would be most populous. Now on the coast, erectus was introduced to the pattern of tidal movements, which offered a perplexing and mysterious consistency year to year. As the patterns early humans analyzed and the tasks we performed became more complex, so did the tools we needed to survive. So take a look at how quickly our tool building advanced while we were in those seaside caves. In just 100,000 years, we went from producing coarse rock tools like these on the left, um, and notice this piece here, which is actually quite a bit more advanced than what we saw earlier from people who were living in the savanna. Uh, this is a tool that requires several other tools to make, uh, whereas most of these other ones are made simply by hitting a rock with another rock. Um, so already there's quite a bit of advancement here, but notice in 100,000 years how far humans come. Uh, the skill it takes to carve these harpoons, for instance, um, is, is the kind of skill that one person simply can't do on their own. Uh, that's the kind of skill that needs to be passed on through mentorship, um, through generations, each new generation having some good ideas, uh, and adding to the legacy that they inherited. And you'll see this piece here, this needle, actually has a hole in it for thread. So these, these early humans on the coast, as, as far back as 60,000 years ago, were, were making their own clothing.
Um, now, it wasn't just this new way of life, uh, a fishing life that allowed these advancements. Our diet on the coast was much more nutritious than it had been on the, on, on the savanna. Um, and you've heard about omega fatty acids, I assume. Uh, as you probably already know, a, a diet rich in seafood has much more of these important brain building chemicals than a diet of roots and bones. As each generation learned to read the coastal patterns and catch fattier and fattier fish, their children were literally born with better built brains. Now, this is a, a, a quick fact, but uh, Homo sapiens on the, on the coast of Africa 60,000 years ago actually had brains 10% bigger than yours or mine. Uh, since the advent of agriculture, human brain capacity has, has begun to shrunk, shrink, um, and it's shrinking really quickly now uh, with people using phones to, to navigate. There are big sections of the brain used for navigation. Those are going black in analyses of the human brain um, among people who are using their phones to navigate, so keep that in mind. Uh, but I'm, I'm way off topic. Uh, this new way of life and the new and improved diet led in just a few tens of thousands of years to these artistic creations that you're seeing here. Uh, the oldest known art anywhere in the world was found in these very caves I've shown you in South Africa. These artifacts are 70,000 years old. On the top left, you'll see an, an ochre palette. Uh, an artist mixed this uh, stuff, it's, it's ground iron mixed with tallow again. Um, and then the artist applied this to the cave walls. There's some residue of that that we can't really see the images that were left there. There's too much weathering in the cave. Um, and someone bored those shells into decorative beads. Those shells there would have no um, literal purpose. They're, they're a, um, you know, a, a symbolic decorative uh, design. Uh, and an artist carved in, in this image in the bottom of the screen um, these almost mathematical symbols into, the, into this rock. Uh, so on this coastline, humans developed a mind for symbolism, uh, for altering physical objects so they might embody figurative meaning. We learn to see the connections between two dissimilar and possibly disconnected entities. Because that's really what any symbolic representation is. Um, but why then and why on the coast? Uh, now this is where archaeology, we leave the archaeology behind. Archaeologists can't find evidence of this kind of stuff potentially. And here's where the artist in me starts to interject. Um, so I think and I hope to convince you that the answer is water and tides specifically. So just imagine for a second that your child's next meal depends on your accurate prediction of when the tide will be low enough for you to reach a productive reef on foot. Like if you've been to the, to the coast and you've looked out there at a real low tide, you see some rocks that, that you've never seen before. And if you've never seen them before, they probably haven't been picked over before. These are, are really fertile places. So eventually you notice that the moon is always half full and in a strange place in the sky when you reach this favorite special reef. The next year you test your observation. When the reef is exposed, again, the moon is half full and it's in the same place in the sky. How can that make any sense at all? How could an object in the sky be so clearly influencing the water at your feet? There's no explanation for that that early humans could, could wrap their minds around. But by wrapping their minds around it, by learning to predict when uh, these reefs would be exposed, to profit from the patterns that they're seeing like, like humans had been doing forever, uh, by doing that, that pattern recognition, um, you could feed your children better. Your children would actually be more fit and be more likely to produce their own children. So humans who got really good at reading the patterns in the world around them, including the tides, they're the ones who prospered. Now, staying with the idea of children for a second, um, maybe your children 
come to notice the connection. You teach your children the connection. And at some point, it was probably a child who asked a parent, why does the moon change the tide? And now I'm going out on a limb, but it was probably a parent making up an answer. A uh, parent doesn't have an answer to that question. And the parent needs to make up an answer. And we, in that moment of exploring a mystery, trying to come up with an answer, um, art is born. Storytelling has probably already been there a long time, but now our storytelling starts to take a figurative leap. And art really, ultimately, is humanity's first tool for making sense of mystery. Now, the climate never stopped changing. Um, and as the deserts of Central Africa reverted to savanna and jungle, Homo sapiens gave in to their urge to explore. Uh, these people who lived on the southern coast of Africa right here, this little refuge uh, that we've been seeing caves of, they are uh, a very small group of humans, actually. The, the only humans to survive uh, what struck the drought that struck Africa. And all of us are related to this group of people right here. This group of people, as the climate improved, began to spread through the world. And you'll see by 13,000 years ago, they've reached the southern end of South America. Um, and in some of these places, not in the Americas, but in Asia and in Europe and in um, Australia, these early humans uh, or early sapiens encountered the descendants of those Homo erectus who'd left Africa um, upwards of about 700,000 years ago. And, you know, those uh, early archaeologists wanted to convince us that there was a war between the groups. Uh, now we know that's probably not likely. Um, the sapiens who found um, Neanderthals, for instance, uh, saw enough kinship that they actually mated um, I, I can use that word for people, and produced offspring of their own. So every European's genetic material is composed of three to seven percent Neanderthal genes. You may know that. Every Asian um, contains three to seven percent Denisovian genes. Um, and those people who uh, are from Nepal uh, and other high regions of Asia, they actually have retained the, the genetic uh, advantage of being able to breathe at altitude without oxygen. That's something that um, has been passed down through the generations uh, for about 70,000 years, which is a striking fact, I think. Uh, and so we moved on. Uh, and everywhere we went, we left art. And one of the um, most striking art forms we left behind are these inverted handprints. Now, these exist on all the continents uh, that humans went to. We didn't get to Antarctica, of course, but uh, everywhere else, these handprints exist. Doesn't matter what cultural background you're from, your ancestors are from, they left these handprints somewhere, and they all did it the same way uh, by taking ochre um, or charcoal and tallow, putting it in a, a reed, putting your hand on the on the rock wall and blowing that pigment against your hand. And now you've left an inverted track. Like these are people who probably did a lot of reading sign and tracks and here a human being is leaving evidence of their being there. So I'd like to end here with uh, a passage from a novel about the end of human existence. Uh, the Road by Cormac McCarthy, which won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 2007. Uh, McCarthy was sitting in a hotel room as a 70-year-old man while his young son, who I think was like seven or eight at the time, uh, was taking a nap. And he was looking at the, at the city with its out of, um, you know, with businesses out of, out of business. And he was looking at the hillside beyond that that had recently been swept by a wildfire. And in that view, he felt this terrible doom uh, that so many modern parents probably feel. Uh, the question, you know, what of this world will be left for the next generation? 
And I don't think it's just parents who feel that feeling. I bet that's something that we all feel these days. Um, and I, I really think nothing could be more human than that worry. Uh, what will be left for the next generation? Well, McCarthy sat down and got to work uh, creating art and uh, using that moment of inspiration as a, as a germ. And here are the final words from the book he wrote, uh, which happened to be about water. Once there were brook trout in the streams in the mountains. You could see them standing in the amber current where the white edges of their fins whippled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polished and muscular and torsional. Never actually said that word out loud. On their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world and its becoming, maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back, not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, John. Um, I wanted to take a moment to open it up to questions. If folks do have questions, put them in the Q&A box, and I can read them aloud for John. I, I have a note here from Dave Moskowitz saying, very well done. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'll say as, as we wait for any questions to trickle in um, that uh, human beings were once an endangered species. Uh, you know, these, these uh, Homo sapiens that survived on the southern coast of Africa, um, had they died off, the, um, it's quite likely that the other human beings elsewhere in the world, uh, the Neanderthals, the Denisovians, uh, they probably weren't going to survive. Um, there's evidence that uh, their populations were severely uh, diminished by the same climactic changes. And it was the adaptations that uh, we developed on the coastline of, of, of Africa that gave us the tools to adapt quickly um, to this new world. And uh, most importantly, um, when you know, we came into a new landscape and we had to figure out how to use it and uh, we had to figure out how to teach our children how to use it and they had to teach their children how to use it. Uh, story likely became a really crucial tool for human survival. Um, religion probably became a really crucial tool for human survival. And there are a lot of scholars who think that it is storytelling um, and religion that are the adaptations that allowed humans um, to prosper once again uh, in, that, in that changed world. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's just so many fascinating things to learn about, about the subject uh, when you dig into it, yeah. I have a question here from you for, from Matt Denniston. Um, he says, such an expansive arc of research. How do you know when you've done enough to support your new book? <laughs> uh, great question, thanks Matt. Um, I think that I'm not a natural researcher, so I'm not like an academic scholar who likes going to the library and getting a big stack of books. Uh, I would always rather go outside and play. Um, so I do research only when I'm compelled by a subject and I actually like really wanna learn more about it. And in this case, uh, every time I would uncover one little thing, I'd have a hundred questions. Uh, you know, for instance, tallow. I was like, well, I've never really heard of tallow. So I did research into tallow. I made tallow. I got a terrible sunburn in Eastern Oregon and put it all over me. Um, and it worked really well, actually. Uh, so the, the research always follows my curiosities. And I always end up doing way more research than I needed to do. Um, a, a person writing a nonfiction book really needs to uh, be able to sort of tell a whole story using all sorts of research drawn from all sorts of places. A novelist actually only needs to stumble upon these grains of gritty content that can make you believe. So for instance, if I talked about how you would make tallow without a stovetop, 
Um, and I talked about that in a really gritty way. You'd probably believe a whole bunch of other things that I made up. Um, and that's sort of the art and trick of fiction. Um, but in order to get to that place, to have the confidence to sort of make it all up like that, um, I do feel like I have to do all the sort of research that a nonfiction writer would do, sort of come to master the world. Um, and, uh, and then I'm able to uh, invent a story um, set in that world. And more importantly, I know what kind of story to invent. Uh, so not to go on too long, but I'll just say that the early versions of this novel were all set back in time. And it was sort of overdoing the research that allowed me to realize that I needed to set the book in the future um, and let that future be informed by what I had learned um, about our past. And actually I came to feel like by doing all that research into deep history, uh, of, of which this is really only a slice of what I did, um, I came to be in a good p position to sort of project what human existence might look like um, you know, some thousands of years down the road. Awesome. Thank you, John. Uh, next question from Fran is, what story do you tell for the future? Yeah, uh, another great question. Thank you, Fran. Um, my goal with, uh, so most stories set in the future are like science fiction. Um, you know, you see like spaceships and, you know, inner plan on travel and, and things like that. But um, what I decided was I wanted to write a story uh, that's set about 6,000 years in the future that could feel like it was set 6,000 years in the past and that could actually be read by people, assuming you know they could learn our language, um, could be read by people 6,000 years ago or 6,000 years from now and have it ring true. So there are a whole lot of things uh, that I imagined that just are too tied to a moment um, in time. And so they got cut from the novel and I, I focus on the things that are timeless, like the relationships between siblings, um, the worry that parents have for their children, um, the, the optimism that young people feel about the future, um, and really these elements that feel essential to the human condition. Um, those are the things that sort of rise up in the novel. Um, and I will say uh, that all of the research I've done, uh, it's about climate change and about the future um, that, that our descendants are likely to experience. Uh, yes, uh, there's great sorrow in the imagining of all these species being lost. There's also some strange dark comfort in knowing that this is actually a story that's a lot older um, than just our moment of human induced climate change and that human beings do have the capacity to survive. Um, and I've, I've come to be one of those people who believes that, um, uh, you know, we're not going to disappear 200 years from now or a thousand years from now. Uh, people will survive for thousands of more years and what might collapse might be some of the you know, we might be using tallow again instead of Crisco. Thank you. Um, next question from Jerry. Did you look at the cave art at Lascaux? Any relation to the Pont d'Arc, even though Lascaux was later? Ah, great question. And you know the art. Uh, yeah, so um, the Lascaux art uh, is 17,000 years old, if I, if I remember correctly. So um, about half as old as uh, the Pont d'Arc art. And when um, I definitely looked at them both, and I have to say I was much more compelled by the Ponta Arc art. Uh, and the reason for that it was, is that it has this um, abstracted quality to it. So abstraction in art, uh, has, it has been there in some form since the very beginning, like those hands are in some way abstracted because they're inverted. Um, and the, there's an image in Lascaux of um, some sort of man that doesn't quite look like a man, maybe like bird related in some way. So that's definitely abstract. But the art in um, the Pointe de Art Cave has that quality of movement and motion, which really struck me as way advanced. Um, it also has much more art that's been added over thousands of years. 
And it has some images which I didn't show you, which to me look like the images that a matriarchy would produce. Um, so there's an image of a bull with a woman's lower half, um, a human being's lower half. And that looks to me like an image of power. Um, and it's nothing like what you'd see in Lascaux. Um, and uh, lastly, there's this great story about the cave, uh, the Pont d'Arc cave. There is a boy's footprint going into the cave. So humans didn't live in caves. Um, we took shelter at the mouth of caves, but there's evidence that we were probably pretty scared of caves in Europe in, in 30,000 years ago. We didn't go in them very often. But a boy um, at some point, about 20,000 years ago, walked into the cave of Point to Arc. And within that same time period, it could have been with the boy. It could have been five minutes later. It could have been 500 years later a wolf walked in and followed the boy's tracks all the way to the back of the cave. Uh, and that just really stuck with me. It made it really feel real in my imagination in a way that Lascaux um, never really came to life for me. Thank you, John. Uh, last question I have here is a, clarif a clarification. Um, Dave says he heard a quote during your introduction, but he's not sure if he got it right. Was the quote, without water, there would not be art? I think so, yeah. And without climate change, there wouldn't be art. Um, without the stresses of climate change, we wouldn't be who we are now. Awesome. Sorry, those are all the questions we've got up here. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to our executive director, John DeVoe, for a couple of last remarks here. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, John. That's quite provocative stuff. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming tonight. Um, first of all, I, ho I hope everyone's healthy and uh, doing well. Um, you know, we heard a lot of provocative threads about why people connect so strongly with water and how important water is to the creative process. Um, Water Watch tends to focus on water as it relates to the needs of ecosystems and species, other than humans usually, but sometimes humans. Um, but John's done a great job illuminating the more intimate and creative human connections to water that are also, uh, if not explicitly, then definitely implicitly uh, informing the work that we do. You know, if climate change did, you know, result in changes in humans in the past that shaped who we are today. Hopefully our response to the current climate crisis will uh, somehow also shape us in a positive way. <laughs> Not so sure of that at the moment, but I'm hopeful. Um, so, it, I mean, this was really interesting to me and I really appreciate you doing this for us. So please consider supporting John. Uh, Neil's gonna put up a website where you can locate John's books uh, and he's also gonna put up uh, a link to our website or our donation process. Um, please consider supporting Water Watch so that we can continue to protect and restore rivers, lakes, wetlands, and aquifers that are essential to ecosystems in Oregon, but are also uh, essential to inspiring people and, uh, as John has demonstrated, uh, prompting the creative process in humans, which is a really essential element of our, our hum humanness. So thank you for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you coming. Uh, Neil has a couple announcements to go on the next uh, uh, parts of our series, which are next Wednesday and the following Wednesday at this point. So let people know about that, Neil, and thank you very much. Um, thank you, John. Yeah, I'm gonna put up a slide here for folks. Let's see, share screen. Give me a moment here. It needs permission to share the screen. Um, having a, it's, it's not letting me do it, John. Do you have the screen up? Do you have that? I'm sorry. Do you have that PowerPoint up on your end? Would you be able to pull it up? It says I need to quit Zoom before it'll let me share the uh, the slide. Um, I can make the announcements without it, though. I will post the link into here. So take a look into the chat here. I'm sending a message out to everybody. 
this uh, website, www.grassrootsbookstore.com, is where you can get a copy of Whiskey When We're Dry for free shipping. Um, John Larson has generously offered to uh, sign or personalize any copies from anybody from this webinar. Um, so please feel free to reach out to him or, or order directly through this website. And if you're interested in supporting WaterWatch, the best way to do it is through our website, www.waterwatch.org slash donate. Um, I see a lot of names that I recognize from our membership base already on this call. So thank you guys for all the support that you could do. Um, but yeah, please consider you know, making a donation and allowing us to continue the work that we do to protect and restore rivers all around Oregon. Um, we do, this is the first in our series. We're gonna be doing this every Wednesday for the next few weeks. Um, next week, uh, we've got Peter Marbach, who is author and photographer. Uh, Join us for a conversation about the Columbia River from his latest book, The Big River, Salmon Dreams, and the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, on the following week uh, at 6 p.m. on August 12th, uh, we're going to be giving a presentation with uh, Dr. Peter, Peter Bruitt, uh, who recently wrote a book called Same River Twice. It's a fascinating look at some of the major dam removal projects that have taken place all across the nation. And it includes a special look at the rogue dam removals in Oregon that WaterWatch has, has been very intimately involved with. Um, so thank you again all for joining us tonight. Really excited to have you here. Thank you again, John, for the amazing presentation. I know I loved it. Um, and we hope to see you all again uh, next week on the 5th and the week after that on the 12th. Hey, Neil. Uh, somebody is saying they aren't seeing the post for the bookstore. Oh, shoot. Maybe there's um, a way to... Um... It's in chat here, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry about the, that the slide isn't working for me. Um, what I will do is send an email out to everybody who uh, signed up for this call as a follow-up so that um, just keep an eye on your inbox and in the next uh, 20 minutes or so here, you should have an email with more details. Thank you, John, John Larson. Thanks everybody yeah. for attending. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs>